Ahoy! Joe Buddy Hambone here, and I'm back again with a brand new coupon code from our friends over at Noble Night Games. This month, and running all the way through March 31st, is the code VRPG23. And that's right, folks. It's VRPG23, good for 10% off your orders. And what a time to be buying new games. Maybe it's really cold this winter and you're looking for ways to stay indoor and have fun with your friends and family. Or maybe you're just looking to fool around and fall in love with a brand new gaming system because, hey, now's the time to pick up something new and give something that you've been thinking about for a little while a chance at the table. VRPG 23, good for 10% off all your orders from our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs with your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse in somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the founder and publisher of Unwinnable. He said, Hambone, today we're going to talk about a different kind of Valentine card, Stu Horvath. <laughs> in March. <laughs> Listen, I, I I don't know what day it is generally. Yeah. I, Ever I, since the launch of the pandemic, I'm always at least a day the behind. launch. <laughs> I mean, I, we're... We're three love, years in, right? Yeah, no, I just I just love the idea of calling it a lot like like it was a planned event <laughs> with like a, a party. It was like the worst party in history. <laughs> and then it got a little bit better, and then it got a little cooler. Mm. And it still sucks, but you know, we're all hanging out there anyway. Cause That's what great. else are we gonna do? Anyway, we're gonna talk about battle cards today. Battle cards. This is like chapter five million, and there's always something new. To be found that's weird and kind of cool i uh i i didn't even find these i was hipped to these by uh zach giolongo who is a comic book artist who has worked for unwinnable a couple times that's so funny that you mentioned that i can't really explain why he is but he's currently doing work for me too i think it's because <laughs> he finally joined our patreon and uh has been on the uh, the Discord. So the cross pollination is complete. Here we are. How serendipitous. Anyway, go on. He's great. He turned me on to two of these things. Uh, Ancestral Trail is another thing uh, that I did not know about that Zach informed me of, and I curse his name for it. Uh, but we're we're gonna talk. I haven't read those yet, so uh, that that's uh, for uh, another episode. There's a lot less reading to do with a set of trading <laughs> cards so we're starting there yeah, i mean you can only fit so many words on the back of a card you know <laughs> you know this this one goes uh very small font there's a lot of words <laughs> so battle cards uh this is a very strange little tale uh they came out in 1993 uh which some folks might know as the date that magic the gathering also uh debuted I believe they both debuted at the same Gen Con. Oh, that had to be tough for battle cards. Uh, yeah. I mean, battle battle cards is not really uh designed to compete with something like Magic. Their cards made for bad. It's such a strange thing, Hambone. It, it's 139 cards in the, the basic set, and then there's eight treasure cards. There's a variety of different card types. There are, of course, checklists. Can't have a set of cards that come in packs of 10 uh, without a checklist card, right? One of the most important cards and highly underrated. I mean, I remember <laughs> being a kid and in, in like cursing the sky when the checklist card would show up. But now as an adult, I see the very important value of it. Especially in a world without the internet. Right? Hmm. <laughs> Ain't it just the way? So there's we'll get into some of the different uh, types of cards later. I want to get into the, the real meat and potatoes of this thing. Um, basically, you have a piece of art and it's surrounded by scratch off circles. You and your your friend or hated enemy uh, sit across from each other and you scratch off those those circles in a, a simulation of combat. It's like scratch offs, except there's no money that you win. You just win. Well, there's sort of like there's money too, so not real money, pretend money. Uh, so weird. Okay, so literally, piece of art, it'll be like Lord of Darkness is the one that I happen to be looking at. And there's a frame that's nicely drawn frame. 
Uh, and then there are literally, I don't know, 25 different circles around it. A couple are labeled head. Uh, there's a couple, there's three labeled arm, two legs. Oh, and then both sides. So, so two heads, three arms, two legs uh, on both sides. And then you have a whole bunch of bodies on the bottom. Oh, there's, and, and they snuck in a couple extra legs uh, uh, at the bottom there. So as you fight, you take your opponent's card and you you scratch off one of their anatomy circles. If it's blank, it's a miss. If it's red, it's a wound. First wound doesn't really count. It's just like, oh, you, you nicked me. The second wound, your opponent has to has to scratch off one of their life circles. Uh, again, if there's nothing under it, you're fine. If there's a skull, you're dead. You give the card to your friend or hated enemy and they get to claim victory. There are only three life circles, and the last one is the purse circle, which the victor scratches off, and there's a a value for gold pieces. Now, the gold pieces you could use if you have a trading post card. You scratch off two circles on the, on the trading post. There'll be a treasure and a number, uh, and then you can... <laughs> you can send in that trading post card and a number of vanquished foes totaling the number to the people who made battle cards and they'll send you a treasure card in return because you bought it from the trading post. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. (laughs) That's just the basic game. I I mean, my initial reaction to it. First, First up, had to be a hard time to be battle cards. Because, like, if you do show up at that Gen Con, it's kind of like, you know, back in the day, kid's got a guitar, he's going to show up to, like, play a local show, and then the headliner is Elvis. Like, (laughs) no one's going to remember you. And, like, this sounds oddly complicated. It's, I mean, it sounds like a great, if it had caught on, it's a great cash grab because you're constantly going to have to keep buying new cards because these cards are useless once you scratch them off. Like, right. There is zero replay value on any of these cards. And I mean, the idea of, okay, cool. They're going to send you a treasure card after you've proven that you spent X amount of dollars scratching off these cards and then paid for your own postage <laughs> to send these cards back to the company where they're just going to get like, I mean, I don't think you can like put scratch off stuff back on a card once it's been scratched off, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, they had to just go in the recycling bin, right? Yeah, or or whatever the bin was at that time. <laughs> I mean, granted, listen, don't get me wrong. As a kid, you know, every kid from an Irish family knows they got those aunts and uncles who like let you scratch the scratchers, you know? <laughs> they, they're, they're sitting there like, you know, having a beer and they're doing their scratchers like here john you you, you scratch one off but you know they're not gonna let you keep the money but like it's fun because you're sitting there like oh wow this is gambling and in a very like light like fun little you know scratch with a lucky penny kind of manner but you know at least like with a scratch off ticket you do have the potential of winning your money back or winning more or at least getting a free scratch off ticket it's like here it's like wow i've got this card with this amazing badass art and it's a great monster and now i just died but i guess like, i scratched the wrong hole and now like i have to give it to my friend <laughs> like that's that's terrible well i mean it's kind of like marbles right like like at, at its very core you know the winner t- gets the pick of the marbles right well yeah but like mar- it's different with marbles because you could you know you buy a bag of marbles that's like it like you're not like having <laughs> you can use to, the marbles over and over you again. can use the marbles over and over again like you don't have to go and like and you can win those marbles back like those marbles will be able to be used again like this scratch off ticket is like dead to you so i'll up the ante a little bit so that's just the base game i actually like you're right it, it the base game is like a little bit complicated but it does pardon the pun scratch that itch with the scratch offs, like, like that's a fun little thing. And then I find the mail in reward system, both compelling and deeply stupid. Like, yeah, Cause exactly. you're only going to get a treasure card. Like, like that's the best that you're going to do. And yet <laughs> I kind of like it. Like, like I, I think that the reward scheme as it is, is flawed, but I think that there's something to it. And I like the notion of it, if not the execution. And then they, they layered in some other stuff. There are quest cards. There's at least nine, ten. Uh, I have them all in baseball card sleeves. 
that basically give you like these little uh you know the one is find the heirs of vangor so like you're looking for there, there are three identical triplets and they're in the card art somewhere and you have to find those cards and again once you find those cards you send them off to the company and you get a reward like i i don't i love the game of that and like <laughs> i love the idea of being rewarded for playing that game but again you're just getting a treasure card in return and that is sort of underwhelming to me the treasure cards that there's a whole bunch of lore cards there's secrets what's secrets oh secrets have like like there's riddle there's all sorts of stuff to unpack here the treasures have coded messages on them there's a series of cards that are uh devoted to advanced battle tactics which is interesting it's it's a different method it's a methodology for how you're you're supposed to to kind of use the uh, rub off circles, scratch off circles to your advantage, which is surprisingly complex. And I like the thought that went into it. Um, I don't know that it really needed to be spread out across eight cards, but I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe it did. But the real appeal, Hambone, all of these things are, are secondary to the reason that I bought these is that they are filled with gorgeous art. Of course they are. Of course they are. That's always the best part of any RPG, whether the RPG is impossible to play, unfun, or like the greatest role-playing game in all space and time. The art is the most important bit. Interestingly, so this is a set of 139 cards and eight treasure cards. There's a 140th card called the Emperor, but I'm not exactly sure how you got it. I mean, I I guess there's some some sort of thing. It, it was obviously a mail-in. And the mail-in expired, after, you know, the offer was off the table after 1994. Why? Because battle cards were off the table in 1994? I mean, I get, that's part of it, too. But they, they also were just like, <laughs> like the game is over in 1994. I mean, I, I think that they wanted to do more um, and they would have done more series. But the 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 first series uh, rewards were discontinued after 1994 from the inception. There's only 139 cards. 140 if you count this other one, 148 total with the re- treasure rewards. You have a number of cards devoted to the checklist. You have a number of cards devoted to advanced tactics. You have and, and like so you're just constantly like winnowing down the number of playable cards. There is actually not that many actual combat cards. Oh, there's also uh there's also magic spells, which I don't understand how they work at all. I've read through them a couple times and I just I don't you use them in in, in addition to your combat. They're, they're just weird. They'll have mechanical complexities that are interesting, but also do not add to the fundamental gameplay in my experience. Um, but they have cool art. But then on top of all of that, you have eight cards devoted to the artists. Like they're literally self-portrait cards. I think that this is great because I think that artists generally don't get enough credit for how awesome they are and right. the awesomeness that they bring to these sorts of projects. But I also think it's sort of a poor use of space. <laughs> It's weird to me a little bit, and they're but they are self portraits in sort of character. Like Les Edwards is definitely uh, Les Edwards in like as King Arthur or Merlin or something. Uh, same with Ian McKay. He's he definitely looks like an adventurer of some sort. Peter Andrew Jones is like a straight up goblin in his painting, and then Terry Oaks is just like a guy in shades. It's it's hilarious. But uh, so you know, I've just listed a, cu- a couple of them. We also have Gino Diakil somebody named Waldmeister and Martin McKenna. And if you've been paying attention at all for the last few years following me, uh, some of these names are should be extremely familiar to you as coming out of the UK school of fantasy art. Les Edwards in particular, I love his stuff. He did the painting, for instance, uh, that is the cover of the Hero Quest board game. All of these guys did a lot of Warhammer stuff, a lot of fighting fantasy stuff. Some of the card art is repurposed fighting fantasy stuff. Uh, in the case of Les Edwards, there is a repurposed Graham Masterson novel cover. Uh, we were talking about this in, in the, the Discord the other day when I discovered it. The painting is most famous as fronting the single for Metallica's Jump in the Fire. Really? Yeah, it's a badass demon with fire. That's just a crop of the entire painting, uh, which fronted Graham Masters, Masterton's novel The Devils of D-Day from 1978 well all right which has that demon which is a very cool metallica demon sort of hovering above a uh a world war ii tank um i have no idea what the 
uh, uh, well, here's a summary. At the Bridge of Levee uh, in July 1944, 13 black tanks smashed through the German lines in an unstoppable, all-destroying fury ride, leaving hundreds of Hitler's soldiers horribly dead. 35 years later, Dan McCook visited this area of Normandy of an investigation of the battle site. So it's like like demons fighting Nazis at D-Day? I don't know. It sounds like a terrible book. Um, <laughs> but it spawned this really... I mean, let's be honest, terrible painting uh, of high quality skill that was since chopped up to made, uh, you know, a pretty iconic early Metallica album art and uh, also a battle card. Love which it. Which I think is just like great. Les Edwards is a fantastic and underrated artist, but all these guys are are, are very much in the, the Warhammer fighting fantasy vibe, which makes the art kind of like for the American market, really dark and gnarly. Yeah. Um, this stuff just never really caught on. Uh, like, like it's the Fiend Folio effect. It's like, like of all of the books, like the Fiend Folio is the coolest, I think, but it is also the least popular because it doesn't adhere to the kind of clean heroic fantasy that that eventually took over in the eighties. There are so many pictures of loincloth barbarians here. It's a fantastic set of art, even if it's small, even if it's repurposed. So many of the guys have really silly names. Like this guy's name is George Lackluster. Like what a name. That's a name for sure john the agreeable oh okay which is a a bold name for a guy with a two-handed sword he does not look agreeable yeah that's pretty fun man <laughs> that's pretty fun croc the hunter venga the grim not venga venga well you know copyright issues you know so you gotta <laughs> guess, you gotta sidestep that Le- legally distinct yeah oh very much so <laughs> baron old schwartz prince gallant Baron Old Schwartz. <laughs> Come on. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah I mean, like, this came out like right around the time of Spaceball. So that's a very like <laughs> on the money joke, you know? Yeah. It's it's a very interesting Prince Lionheart, uh, which is like, okay, no duh. It's a very interesting sort of moment in time. It is, but they are so beautiful. Like, they really are. And it, it, it should this, no. No, this should not have caught on. Like, there's no way. Like, like this was it. This is by Steve Jackson. Steve Jackson of the UK, not the Texan, sort of conceived and gets credit for this. Uh, and it, it really feels like another sort of outpost in the world of fighting fantasy. Uh, the, these sort of unique game forms that that they were playing with that sort of spun out of uh, fighting fantasy. And and it's interesting and it's cool. I love the fact that it exists, but like it was like it's so doomed from the start. I think. I, like I don't even feel a little sad about. It. Like it's just, just it, it is it is the definition of an oddity. I think. Yeah, I mean it. It's definitely like a, a piece of RPG ephemera that is like very specific to a place and time. And you know, I know sometimes I get a little snarky on the show and I make these little funny jokes and like. If you are really passionate about battle cards, good for you. And shout out to Steve Jackson Games uh, in the UK for always taking a big swing. You know, they they definitely didn't do the absolute traditional style RPG games. You know, they 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 took some really cool swings, and and I appreciate that. I think that's a a very very cool thing. I think they also underestimated what Americans do with scratch offs uh, <laughs> by and large. <laughs> But, you know, nonetheless, uh, you know, shout out to them for taking like a really big swing. I mean, uh, this didn't this didn't by any sense of what I've I've been able to find out. This didn't succeed in the UK either. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's hard to justify. I mean, I was just Googling. Right. So Magic the Gathering packs in 1995, because that's all I could find were two dollars and forty five cents. Right. Which in 1995. 1997 like i was spending like a dollar for a gallon of gas so like to justify like spending 245 on something that i literally was going to throw in the garbage after i was done with because i had scratched it off and there was no replay value with it that's that's tough you know that's like a, a little bit of a stretch or like you know it's not like a comic book that i can collect that's going to be like worth a bunch of money in time potentially because i think that was like right before the comic market dropped as well and also like a stamp was 29 cents so like Having to ship it domestically to get that card back was twenty nine cents. I don't know if you'd have to ship it to the UK, which would probably be like a buck back then for a stamp to send it overseas. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, there is a, uh, a San Diego uh, address. Okay, for, for yeah. the US. Yeah, but still, 
I go back to my analogy. You're the kid who's like locally handsome with the cool hair and you got a guitar. You're going to go sing your song at the sh- county fair and then Elvis shows up like it, it, it's it's hard competition. So Magic the Gathering coming out the same year, understandably buried it. Like there's really no way around it. But, you know, um, do you think anyone actually has like a set of unscratched cards, like fully on un- full set? But battle battle cards? Yeah. Yours truly. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. So uh Zach was telling me about this and uh he was just like, Have you ever heard of these? And he sends me an eBay link. So I look at the thing and I was just like, No, I've never heard of these. It was just a sealed box, like like one box. But because I looked at it online, you know, I was signed into my account and everything. Uh, the vendor, they, they they wanted like 15 bucks for it. And the vendor like sent me an offer like 24 hours later being like, I'll give it to you for 10. I was like, shit, <laughs> fine. Send it to me. That's and, a drop. <laughs> and like, so I sat there uh, opening up the packs and I was like, what are the odds of this having a full set in, in one box? And it did a uh, full set plus three of the treasure cards. So, yes, I, I do. I'll tell you that handling the cards, uh, the scratch offs, uh, I don't know if it's age or if it's it's just cheapness, but the you could feel the scratch off ink, the metallic scratch off ink wanting to like just pop off. Yeah, <laughs> like not scratch off, just kind of like like if you shuffled these, I feel like they, they would fly out like a bunch of like like gold dots. Yeah, I mean, like uh, a scratcher from 1993, a hard fart to probably blow that right off, you know, like, yeah. Damn, dude. So, so you have like the emperor too, or you just? Have I don't the... have the emperor. I haven't been able to find the emperor again. I, I'm not. I'm not once. I, I think that the emperor was a, a reward card, and and then I think that that's just like like going to be really hard to find. Well, man, that's fun. I mean, collecting stuff is fun, and Lord only knows you probably had to carve out a little spot in the clubhouse for him. But here they are, a full set of battle cards. <laughs> I mean. Highly recommended just for the art. You know, like I said, I pulled I, the box was there, and there's plenty of. They're probably going to go up to a whole like twenty dollars a box now, um, but still, I think that's a pretty good price for you know. It, it's going to give. It's going to return you a, a basically a full set. I think Zach was missing one when he finished his box, and uh, he well, hey, for on. ten bucks, he can get a whole nother set, get the one he needs, and then scratch <laughs> off the rest. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, there are singles on eBay uh, that don't go for a whole lot of money. You know, th- the more I'm thinking about this, though, I think that there is like a larger tradition of of, of card games like this in the UK that I'm I'm, I'm suddenly very interested in because I'm, I'm I, I I remember these and I don't know the name of them and because I'm I'm American I, like like I don't have like that that nostalgia history to kind of like draw on but I think that there was a series of horror cards horror themed cards. I don't think there were scratch offs, but I think that there were stats and stuff that like you could you could like play cards and like throw down cards and, and figure out who a winner was. And I'm I'm trying to Google around looking for that. And I see that there are Citadel combat cards that have the same kind of Citadel is the miniatures producer that was eventually folded into Games Workshop. So Warhammer had a series of cards that kind of function look like they function the way I picture these horror cards. So I'm I'm beginning to wonder if this is this is an outgrowth of like a British school kid thing uh from the 70s, 80s and 90s. And if it is and you're a UK listener, uh drop me a line and uh learn me something because uh I think it's cool. Uh I think I I just think I I I think that the the scratch off I think the battle cards was trying to do too much and and it just doesn't come together but i i could see like these these citadel combat cards that i'm looking at look a little bit more simple and they also aren't ruined in the use of them like you kind of just like uh it looks like you just either they're just reference or you 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 could just like throw them down match them up see who wins which is cool i think that's how the horror cards if i i, I again though i i just just can't quite remember uh, or, or like come up with the search term. So if you know about horror cards in the UK, let me know. So one thing I will tell you, though, a little sidebar here, uh, Adam Vass, World Champ Game Co., mm. uh, friend of the show, friend of mine, uh, he does scratch off games, right? He had one recently called Roll for Clues, scratch off RPG. And essentially, you know, you get clues by scratching the card off, right? Mm. Um, so... It's a postcard with a procedurally generated random missing person on the front, obscured by a scratch-off area. 
and it gives you a very fun way to solve mysteries because it's it's so much potential because it's all random, you know? Um, and the rules are printed on the back of the card. He also had another set uh, of cards where you would scratch off to get your stats, and that would be the stats for your uh, player. That's cool. Right? And that's, like, to me, that's, you know, a little more reusable. Like, yeah, the mystery one, once you solve the mystery, the mystery's over. You know, it's not like watching reruns of Columbo, as I've been wont to do. But I think <laughs> that, like, when you have stats, yeah, uh, scratch and claw RPG cards, where you, it tells you what kind of creature you are, you scratch off your stats, and then you play that creature. Like that to me is like a, has a little more replayability and intrinsic value than like you know, up oh, cut my arm off. Now this card is dead to me unless I'm going to frame <laughs> it and look at this art. <laughs> but it just goes to show that there are ways that like you can do this with the scratch off medium. And yes, I, I did think about that at the very end of the show, but you know, sometimes it takes me a little longer to get there. I got pudding brain. <laughs> anyway, Stu, is there uh, any final thoughts on battle cards? While you were talking about that, uh, this is my final thought. I have found the horror cards that I thought I was trying to remember. They're called top Trump's horror cards. Uh, I'm looking at the Dracula set for 1978. Uh, I haven't had time to look at how it works, but uh, they are, not nearly as pretty as battle cards, but uh, they are illustrated cards with a set of four stats, and there is a competitive card game that you can play with them. Uh, so this does uh, seem to be a uh, a thing that was popular in the UK. Uh, this one's great. There, there, there's a lot of legally distinct stuff here. Like Lord of Death is, I think, uh, looks very much like Doctor Fibes, but oh well, they have King Kong and Godzilla. So I, hey, you know. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> you never know. Oh, wait, Stuart, uh, you logged in, though, when you looked at that? It's a trap! Oh, no! God Sell, damn it. Seller contacts you offers to sell you for $7 tomorrow. Ugh, great. More stuff. So as we wrap up this episode, I uh, just want to mention our Patreon. Thank you to everybody who recently joined our Patreon. There's a bunch of you, and we're so happy to have you come aboard. You know, people have been signing up for Stu's West March game. Uh, people are going to be playing RPGs with me over on the Patreon. You know, we get early release episodes over there as well. So you get it at some point on Friday. Uh, and, you know, we're stoked to have you on board and have these great conversations in our patron lounge. So thank you so much for taking the time and investing in our Patreon and investing in us. We really do appreciate that. One of the things that we're going to do is start shouting at people. Right, Stu? Yes, indeed. At the five dollar tier, if you got something cool you're working on, we will absolutely highlight you and your project to our patrons and our followers. So today, uh, we've got Dean Browell. Now, Dean Browell is good people. I have rolled dice with this dude. Became friendly with him over the pandemic, uh, as I've become friends with many people over the pandemic. <laughs> and uh, for his shout out, you know, he's a longtime vintage RPG fan. Uh, he is the creator of the unique response light RPG that blends the excitement and humanity of space programs with the gasping breath of exploration. Uh, you could check it out at responserpg.com. Uh, it'll take you to a Facebook page for the response RPG. Uh, you can sign up there. You could check out and learn more about it there. Responserpg.com. Dean, big fan of you, buddy. Thank you for signing up for the tier that gets you the shout out. And uh, look forward to rolling dice again with you soon. So this was another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can the people find you on the internet? Uh, for the moment, uh, you can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG. It's getting a little annoying, so I think I might try uh, experimenting with some Mastodon uh, at, over at Dice Camp. We'll see what happens. Really? Yeah, it's so bad, dude. It's so bad now. Really? Like, like just people's comments I and... No, no, it's just people aren't seeing my stuff. It, it's really uh, frustrating, like yeah. deeply, deeply frustrating. Yeah, I have I uh, because the original book proposal was a, like a, a, a pinpointable time. I wrote that uh, in 2019. I had half the followers that I have now, and I have I had double the the engagement. It's ridiculous. Curse you, algorithm! It's terrible. I had I, like it, it, it. Like I don't want to be like one of those people who complains about like like numbers, but man. I should be getting more than 300 likes for a advanced fighting fantasy book with, illustrated by Russ Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> like no. It's just like, it's deeply frustrating that nobody's seeing this stuff. I mean, you did put a lot of time into building that Instagram up. So like the fact yeah. that like your fans and people who have followed you can't see you. That's a big problem. 
I guess yeah. because you're not posting reels, which they're like, well, if you're not going to post reels and no one's going to see your shit anymore, which is whatever. It is what it is. You can find me across the Internet at John McGuire <laughs> RPG. Oh, that's so frustrating. Um, I will be posting more because I do have something to promote coming out very shortly, but I'm not going to talk about it yet. You're going you're gonna to see the, the reveal coming up very soon. It's something that is absolutely ridiculous, but I swear to God, it's totally real. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'll be posting more uh, on that. You can also chat with us over on our Discord. We've got a killer Discord community we'd love for you to be a part of. Patrons get the private Discord server with Stu and I just kicking it every day, uh, shooting the breeze and, uh, you know, bullshit with all our, our friends and people who uh, like the stuff that we do and we like the stuff that you do. So it's a it's a cool little party. Uh, unlike the COVID allegory that I made earlier in the episode, it's actually a good time. Um, <laughs> if you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe because your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. And with that, I'll say to you, for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 